All right, so brief introduction to what this talk is. I'm going to talk about security paradigms, security considerations, and we're going to build up to an example workflow for what's called secure introduction into containers. Um, this is about applied security. It's not about crypto theory. I'm not going to go way too down low. What I want is for you to understand why some of these things matter, the security principles that we've built into Vault, and how you can actually make really nice workflows based on them. This talk isn't one true answer. You're not going to understand your organization's security policy and like, exactly what you need to do all around your organization based on it. Um, each organization really needs to set their own security policy. And I'm not going to talk about like, very low level like hypervisor OS security. We're going to keep things kind of higher level than that and just talk about um, secrets in terms of secure introduction to containers. Um, it's not a deep dive into security rabbit holes. Um, for those that, uh, that know about the, the story about you know, the Earth sitting on a turtle, and what's below that, it's another turtle, what's below that, another turtle. It's turtles all the way down, is the, uh, the phrase. Um, we're not going to go there. In security terms, that usually means increasing levels of paranoia. Um, we're going to stop like somewhere about there. OK, so for four slides, I'm going to establish some terms. And the reason I'm doing this is to help you understand how we think about security in like, the applied security world and what, what we mean when we talk about security and secrets and threats. So it's only four slides, I promise. We'll get through them fast. So what is security? Security is the practice of risk management, all right? Accepting some risks, guarding against others, um, and against violations of norms. Norms are things like um, somebody random should not have access to my database, right? That's a norm. Um, and if you think about, like if you aren't quite on board with talking about risk management, if you think about bodyguards, personal security, what are they there for? They're there to you know, make sure somebody doesn't come up to you and break your arm, right? Risk management. Risk increases with system complexity. The more complex your system, the more moving parts you have, the higher your risk. More points of ingress and egress of data, failure, confusion. Um, anything that elevates risk is a threat. Right? So modeling threats is about modeling risk management, and it's a core part of security policy. So secret. A secret is something that elevates your risk if it gets exposed to unauthorized entities. Um, and that causes harm. So harm can come in many forms. It could be unauthorized data access. It could be regulatory fines if someone finds out that you're doing something you shouldn't be. It can even be something as simple as embarrassment to the company. You know, if your CEO says something embarrassing that causes the public to over time lose trust or just decide that they don't want to do business with you, then that eventually leads to harm. So any exposed secret, by definition, is a threat. It elevates your risk, so it's a threat. And not all things that can be disclosed are secrets. So for instance, if you have a username and a password, the username is usually not that, uh, that well protected. It's kind of public in many terms, or uh, many cases, but a password is secret. If you have a TLS certificate, the certificate itself is, is uh, public, but the key that allows you to sign requests and, and perform TLS, that's private, right? So identifiers aren't completely risk-free, but usually we choose to ignore that risk. And finally, fourth slide, what is trust? A trusted entity is one that will not divulge the secrets it has access to at least not willingly. So when you model trusted entities, it's, it's the counterpart to modeling threats, right? So you model threats, these are things that can, can cause harm to your organization, um, and you model trusted entities as part of that to decide what are the things that, that aren't threats to us. Um, and there are two concepts here, a circle of trust and a chain of trust. Okay, circle of trust <clears throat> are, th are entities that we trust with any secret. So this can be your CPU, your RAM, for this talk at least, we're talking about CPU, RAM, your secret management tool, Employees, potentially. You know, you may trust some employees, you may not trust others. Um, your root user. Um, and there are things that are outside your circle of trust. The NSA is probably outside your circle of trust. Um, your mother's notepad.txt, where she stores her passwords, not in your circle of trust. So the only allowed long term storage is in your circle of trust. A secret should not live anywhere else outside of that. So a chain of trust is a set of links, often network hops in this world, that any particular secret travels through from entity A to entity B, where entity A and B are in your circle of trust. So if you want to get from your secret management tool to your container's RAM, that's, that's defining a chain of trust. You have those two endpoints on the chain, and you have these links in the middle, right? And so any link is an access point or interception point. So if I trust, you know, if I trust uh, Alice and Bob, and I say something to Alice, she says something to Bob, it's okay, I trust all of them. But if there's a microphone in the room and they pick up what I'm saying, that's a, that's a, a link that, was, uh, that, was, that caused uh, disclosure, right? So any link is an access point or interception point. So it could be logging, it could be exploitation, it could be someone putting their password on the monitor with a, with a uh, post-it uh, post employee, a uh, post-it note. 
Sorry? OK, so now we can establish the problem space, now that we've talked about this. So when you want to manage secrets and you want to manage them in a container environment, then it basically means establishing trust chains, or really anywhere that you want to manage them. It's about establishing trust chains. And because links have associated risk, right, they're places where things can be accessed or exposed, then you want to minimize the hops and minimize the risk per link. You can't fully mitigate risk. You should basically proceed on the assumption that everything will eventually get exposed. So what you want to do is make that chance as low as possible. But there's no such thing as zero risk. Um, and the ultimate goal is also zero trust, right? You know, don't give the opportunity for, for um, risks to occur in the first place. You know, there's a saying that the only truly secret thing is something that you've encrypted with one, a one-time pad and like burned the code book, right? You know, you can get as close to that as possible, but it's, there's no such thing as, a, as something that's totally risk-free. OK, so here's an example goal, right? We have a scheduler. We have a scheduler agent. Anyone that's running containers at scale is probably running an orchestration tool or a scheduler. Um, we want to get uh, a secret from the originator, scheduler, scheduler agent, to the new container's RAM. So for the purpose of this talk, remember, the secret management tool we trust, the scheduler agent we're going to trust maybe, kind of, and we entrust the container's RAM. But what does it look like? Does it look like this? Do we go from scheduler to the agent to a container? Does it look like that secret management tool to an agent? Who knows, right? We have to figure this out. So in order to do this, we need to understand secret protection. So when you establish a train, a train of trust, sorry, a, a chain of trust, it requires defining the requirements must fulfill to keep secrets protected. So the good news is we often need to do this for only one secret. So sometimes that's because we only need a database password, right? That's all we need to get to the container. But often it's because the first secret just authenticates us to get more, right? So if the first secret is a token for Vault, for instance, then you can use that to get other things outside of Vault according to your security policy. And if you can protect this first secret, you can protect pretty much any secret. So if you can protect the token on the way to the container, then you can then use TLS between you and the Vault server, and you can make sure that that, um, that that is protecting your further interactions. So this concept is secure introduction. It's getting that first secret to a container. How do you protect secrets? So first you have to understand your success criteria. What does it mean to decide that your secret has been protected? Um, so for this talk, we're going to establish five. One is don't let them live forever. Don't let your secrets live forever. They have to rotate or expire. Distribute them securely. Limit exposure if disclosed. Have a break glass procedure. And detect unauthorized access. OK. So rotation. As lifetime increases of a secret, the chance for exposure goes to infinity. Um, things get to caches or logs. Someone accidentally sees something while they're debugging. Um, Someone cracks it over enough time because you've used the same key for 10 years and they've collected tons of packets. Um, debugging, right? Things just have a way of showing up. And so secrets should, re secrets should be rotated frequently, in quotes. So there's user and, and machine secrets, and you have to deal with them differently. Um, so those four words up there, anyone know what they are? Shout it out. Yes, correct horse battery staple. If you've seen that XKCD cartoon about password management, then it makes the case that if you have really complex security policies and they have to be rotated, or sorry, password policies, and it has to be rotated very often, no one's going to remember it. They're going to write it down. If you have something that is relatively simple that you can map to, say, an image in your mind, then you'll remember it forever. And the, at the end of the comic, he says, you've already memorized this password. And it's true. I just, you know, someone just pulled it out of a hat, right? So you don't want to have bad kind of secret management policies in terms of rotation. But the less frequently that you rotate, the more, the more likely it'll be overseen eventually. The good news is that users and machines work very differently. And for machines, it's really just coding rotation in. You have to do that at the beginning. You have to understand the fact that you're going to rotate your secrets. But because it's all automatic, because it's just code, you can do it very easily, as opposed to users who have to remember this. So distribution, the literal movement along the chain of trust, to or from people or machines. So that could be a person typing in a password that gets to a secret management tool and gets them a token back, right? Or it could be one machine that is um, starting up a Docker container and is an agent and wants to get that Docker container um, introduced. Uh, at the base level, it should never be plain text, right? I think that's probably pretty obvious. Um, it should always be covered. That could be encryption. It could be wrapping. We want to limit exposure. So principle of least privilege. If you don't have access to something, then you can't disclose it, right? So anything that has access to secrets that can potentially divulge it and cause harm to your organization, um, 
should only have access to the secrets that they need. So they should only have access to the database tables that they need or the login credentials that they need. And this is pretty basic, but we just want to make sure that that's part of our success criteria. Uh, access detection. Things have a way of being leaky. They really do. Um, for instance, environment variables. Many, many Docker images that you'll see on the, the official Docker registry uh, say, OK, passing your password is an environment variable. Those environment variables are very easy to see. Docker inspect, right? Operator goes on the machine, does Docker inspect. Or oftentimes you'll see things that just log the environment, log the, basically log the output of Docker inspect to logs because you know, that's useful for debugging. So you don't want to have passwords inside your environment variables. You can't consider those to be secure. So equally as important as protecting secret is knowing if an unintended party has seen it. That's a part of access detection. Autologs are great, right? We want autologs. They're really good to know when someone has accessed something. But do you actually look at them? Who like regularly looks at autologs? One person, two, kind of. So people don't regularly look at autologs, even though they're very important to have. So when you can do active, dete active detection of someone accessing a secret that they weren't authorized to access, that's much better. So break glass. So for those that don't know what this is, um, I think this might be a, ver a fairly like US specific thing. So break glass procedure. So in the US, when you have um, like a fire axe or a fire extinguisher in a commercial building, very often it's not just mounted on the wall, it's in a case. And it says, in, in case of emergency, break glass. So you break the glass, you get it, and, and the act of breaking the glass triggers an alarm. So it's not something that someone will randomly do. You're not going to just randomly open it and cause an alarm. You have to actually willfully break that glass. But it means that that's, when you're in an emergency state, that's how you rescue. So you need a break glass procedure. So if you're compromised, one, one thing you might do is you might say, OK, I'm going to stop all access to resources. I'm going to perform forensics, and then I'll rotate everything and establish trust again, make sure that I know exactly who everyone is, what every machine is. And you need to figure this part out during the planning process. I can't emphasize that enough. You need to assume that secrets will get divulged and that you need a break glass procedure. OK, that's it. Those are our five criteria. And it probably sounds very, very complicated. And that's true. But there's good news. Secret management tools, um, a recent explosion of them, actually. You've seen KeyWiz, Knox, Conjure, many more. And because this is a vendor talk, and because I work on Vault, I get to do this. <laughs> so if you only take away two things from this talk, it's the following. Write your own crypto. Use it in a secret management tool. No, don't ever do this, OK? Don't ever write your own crypto. You've probably all heard that, right? And just like you wouldn't write your own crypto, use a secret management tool and don't write your own. It's very hard. It takes a lot, a lot, a lot of careful thought. So why should you use a secret management tool? Um, a lot of times people say, I'm putting all my eggs in one basket, and that's true. But central and secure storage avoids secret sprawl. Secret sprawl is when you have things all over the place. You can't manage access. You can't manage lifetimes. You can't manage um, authorization. It's very hard to actually, when you have secrets spread out in you know, these files and those password managers and those GitHub repositories, it's very hard to actually understand who has ever seen those. So having a centralized store avoids that kind of sprawl, which overall will make you safer. Central management, access control policies, things like that. You have one place you can go. You can look. You can make sure that things are sane. Uh, codified secure access mechanisms. You can enforce the fact that TLS 1.2 is required in order to access a secret instead of falling back to SSL v3 for some reason. Um, centralized auditing. You can make sure that anytime someone accesses a secret or generates a secret, that you know about it. It goes to an autolog. And finally, they manage secret rotation, revocation, and expiration. OK. So s secret management and secure introduction. Another nice thing about these tools is that there's an explicit focus on the secure introduction problem. Right? So when you're building a secret management tool, you have to be thinking about this from the ground up. And it can be hard to bake it in like right at the very beginning, but it's one of those things you're constantly thinking about. And ideally, a secret management tool provides you with necessary primitives, security primitives, and tools and capabilities to have good secure introduction. So containers can support existing me uh, mechanisms, but think about this. What if you have 100,000 containers and you have to put in 100,000 users into LDAP or Active Directory. Probably don't want to do that. Um, or 100,000 Kerberos key tabs, which is something I've actually heard of, is dropping a Kerberos key tab in thousands, thousands, thousands of containers. Um, if you can do that securely, you have already solved secure introduction. Congratulations, you're done, right? But in most cases, 
you know, it's very hard to actually do that in a secure fashion. You know, if you put users in LDAP, you still have to get them the password, right? So you still have a secret you have to get in that container. So why Vault specifically? Again, vendor talk, it's kind of nice. Um, Vault does things that other SM tools can't, and other SM tools do things that Vault can. That's a given, right? One reason that I suggest Vault is that we have an explicit focus on providing security primitives. These are things like expirations and so on, um, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, this enables the creation of complex workflows like the one that we'll see where you can devise these workflows and you can have a really good understanding and really good sense of trust in the fact that your secrets are not gonna get divulged. So another thing is that secret management tools are really good integration points with schedulers. So anyone working with containers at a scale uses a scheduler. Hopefully it's Nomad or will be Nomad. Um, might be Mesos, Fleet, Swarm, Kubernetes. Um, and schedulers are sources of truth. They know what jobs are running. They know what profiles they have. They started them, right? And they provide hooks. Um, and this is more of a where the future is headed slide. I'm not claiming that there's integration at this point. And obviously I'll talk about Nomad and Vault uh, briefly at the end of this, but uh, they can be a magical combination. So right now, glue code is often needed. There's no direct integration, but um, avoiding like tight coupling means better reuse. And also it means that you can trust, uh, you can say this is a trusted third party. My secret, uh, sorry, my um, orchestration tool can be a trusted third party for my secret management tool where you say, you know, it has actually run these jobs, it knows what's running, so I'm gonna trust that when it says I need a token for this, uh, you know, with this profile, for this particular application, that it knows that that's running. Okay, so back to this problem space. And, you can, and uh, since I'm talking specifically about vault capabilities, I've uh, changed this to say vault, but um, this is still kind of a generic secret management tool kind of uh, concept. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about this part of secure introduction because this is what I'll call a traditional uh, method. So this is something like, um, you know, if you have a scheduler running on an EC2 box, you could, for instance, use AWS EC2 with a vault secure intro client um, and get an initial token to the scheduler, right? So that's, that's kind of the well understood workflow. Um, and I won't go into that too much, uh, but I'll just kind of hand wave it away because I wanna focus on uh, the next part. So let's imagine that we've done this and our scheduler agent has a token, and it has unlimited uses, it has a TTL that it can renew, and it has a policy called create app tokens. So this might map to something like token store roles, where it says, you know, I've given you the ability to create tokens that have other policies attached that are specific to the type of application I may want to run. So that's the traditional style. And then, <clears throat> uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, wrong button. Knew this should have shown up. <laughs> new style. Um, so this is the, the new part that we want to uh, do. We want to spin up a container and securely introduce it. So it's some preconditions. I want to remind everyone of like, some of the properties of alt tokens. So we have unlimited, limited use count, limited time to live, possibly renewable, but possibly not, a set of authorization policies. Right? So for instance, um, as I described in, in the previous slide, you could have one policy given to your scheduling agent that says you are allowed to uh, to issue tokens with other policies for the applications that you start. Um, consistent ID and audit logs, which is very important. And one thing that, that uh, Vault has that's nice is token scoped secure storage. So the cubbyhole backend is token scoped secure storage. Um, only that token can actually access anything that you put in there uh, or write into it, read it up. So the claim I'm gonna make is that these primitives allow for really good SI for containers. And I'm gonna go through a workflow and show how that works. Um, but I think, and then at the end, we'll go through that checklist that I set up. So this is our uh, state of the world. So step one would be that the scheduler would go to the agent and say, we're starting an app called that, that is a DB writer. Um, the app is DB writer, write stuff to the DB. So the policy that it should get is uh, app DB RW policy, right? So application writing to a DB, read write. And sends that to the scheduler agent, which says, okay, I'm gonna start this job, and so I need to create a token with this policy. So your secret management tool, or Vault, can send this back. And what we're doing here is what was described yesterday in the keynote, which is called response wrapping. So it can send back this, this value and say, all right, here's the, the, uh, the token in the middle, which is uses unlimited TTL one hour renewable. It has a policy that we want. It's gonna be inside this, this uh, scope storage, inside the cubbyhole of another token, which has a single use, expires in 30 seconds, is not renewable, and it has a policy that only allows it to just read the cubbyhole. 
scheduler agent doesn't even need to, doesn't need to know what came back. All it needs to know is I have this, this uh, single-use token, and it sends it off to the container in environment variable, say, or on a tempfs. I mean, I'm going to show why you can use this in environment variables um, and why that is a decent idea in this methodology. But it could be you know, in tempfs, so that's writing to RAM that it then mounts into the container. The container then calls Vault and says, I want to unwrap this. And Vault says, great. You know, I've read, it out of, read the uh, value out of the cubbyhole. Here's the value. So now the, uh, the container has a token. So that's, done, that's a secure introduction. And now the container can say, I want to get DB creds or you know, get uh, user password expiration. Or I could say, you know, I want to get S3 creds. Or I could say things like, I want to get a TLS cert. All right, so now, how did we do? Well, if we look at the previous list we had, we said we don't want to let these secrets last, live forever. We want them to rotate or expire. So the outer token has a use limit and expires at 30 seconds, right? And it has the only copy of the inner, of the inner token value. When that token gets revoked, that inner storage goes away. Uh, we distribute them securely. The inner token is covered the entire way. Um, it's not, never divulged in anything that could be uh, logged publicly. publicly. Uh, if disclosed, we have limited exposure. It has only the policies necessary for it to function. We have a break glass procedure. So we can lock down access at the secure management tool if we've detected a uh, disclosure. And audit logs ensure that we know the area of exposure. So we can see what was done with that token. We have a consistent ID in the audit logs, and we can go through the audit logs and say, OK, um, w was this used to generate um, a lease to here? Was this used to do that? We can actually just go and look at the, the operations. So now, detecting unauthorized access. So just going back to this picture for a moment. So we have this inner token. That's what we want. We have the outer token that wraps it with a single use and 30 seconds. So we can detect un unauthorized access of the real authentication token due to the time and the use limit. So for instance, the application reads the inner storage, um, or the inner token. On success, great, done. If it's able to successfully read but not get a token back, we log an error. Something weird happened. Um, maybe we didn't make the right call to Vault to request what we wanted. So we just error, and we say, sorry, a startup failed. However, if we get an invalid token, we look at the current time and the TTL that was on the outer token. So if we are past that current time, then we can say, look, probably what happened, we might want to go and do due, dil 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 due diligence uh, in the audit logs, but probably what happened is that it took too long for us to start up, and it's expired. Right? But if it's not expired, if we're still within that period, and we can't use the token that says it's unauthorized, raise a high priority security alert. It means someone got it. Maybe it got logged to an audit log or to an access log right away on container startup, and someone just was watching for that and pulled it out and used it. So we can detect unauthorized access. So, if, so we can detect it during the time that it's, uh, that it's available. And after the fact, if someone's looking at these logs after 30 seconds, and that value could be whatever you want, but after the fact, someone can look at the log and attempt to use it, and it's gone. The token has expired. It's been used. And this mechanism is not container specific. So one reason that we built this response wrapping into, um, uh, into basically almost the entire Vault API is that it's not container specific. So, uh, uh, the uh, configuration management tool could generate a token, drop it onto an EC2 instance, right? You can inject it into a shroot with a file, right? The, the wrapping token. You can do all sorts of things with it. And one of the things that, I, that last, uh, that yesterday at the conference, I was talking to a lot of different people, and a common theme was something along the lines of, I'm using Puppet, and right now we're just reading Puppet secrets out of a, out of a, uh, um, I forget the name Puppet used, Chef uses data bags, but we're, we're reading Puppet secrets out of a, a file, local encrypted file. And we want to get this to something that we're starting up. How do we do this? Like, how can we do this more securely? And the answer is, have your Puppet master make the call and wrap it, request wrapping, and then send that wrap token down to your application. The application can unwrap it, and if it can't, it can do the appropriate uh, action, raise the appropriate alert. And a really nice thing also is that if you're generating tokens this way, if a token is what's being wrapped, the accessor to the token um, will be uh, returned along with the, the information about the wrapping token. So for those that don't know, when you generate a vault token, you get something called the token accessor. And you can control whether or not those accessors are shown in plain text in the audit logs. Um, by default, they're HMAC, but you can actually, when you're enabling an audit backend, you can say, I want to have this be in plain text. So what can happen is if you detect that something weird is happening, 
you can go and you can find that token. You can find when someone logged in or when it was created and store that accessor in, or look it up at the audit logs. And you can say, all right, I'm going to use this accessor to revoke the token. The only two things you can do with the accessor are you can look up information about the token, except for the token ID itself, or you can revoke it. So in the previous example, if we had something like a, a scheduler generate a token for an application, it can store the accessor along with the job information, right? So as soon as that job is done, it can actually just revoke the token, which will immediately revoke both the token and any associated leases. So integration. I'm sure a question that you're all wondering is, when will this be integrated into Nomad? Um, it's uh, inactive planning. So by planning, don't take that to mean that we're only sort of thinking about it, like it's actively being worked on. Um, and uh, mechanism is going to be very similar, although we have some tweaks that we're going to make to it. Um, to enhance security in kind of nomad-specific ways and to add some useful additional functionality. But I didn't want to talk specifically about things that we're thinking about with nomad because I wanted to keep it at a more high level to, uh, to allow, um, sorry, uh, keep it at a more high level to allow uh, kind of an idea of the, the paradigm of the workflow rather than something specific to HashiCorp tools. Okay, so as a quick wrap up, plan your risk tolerance, security policy, success criteria in advance. That's something that you need to do. And whether you're using Vault or something else, or if you don't have any, any uh, secret management tool, but you're thinking about security for your organization, the sooner you do it, the better. Because you need to know what, what to do. Um, you need to know what workflows you need, how to actually implement them. You need to know what to do if, if there's unauthorized access. Um, and use a secret management tool, ideally Vault. Um, as I said, you know, Vault provides all these security primitives that enable this workflow, which is very nice. Um, and I don't know if other secret management tools do, although I believe most of them don't. Um, and uh, use a secret management tool. You're very smart, but this is a hard thing. So just like you wouldn't write your own crypto, trust secret management tool, don't try to roll it yourself. It's very difficult. Um, so that's it. So uh, questions? <laughs>